always find when communicating with your little one and navigating through those ups and downs of parenthood, that trying to think like they do is a big help. Yes, of course it's easier said than done. Applying a good dose of empathy and thinking like they do often goes a long way and helps a lot. And yes, it can be hard, but it's worth it. In this week's episode of First Time Moms Chat, I'm talking with author, special educator and behaviour therapist Chris Lake. Chris had his first child during the COVID pandemic and his interactions led him to write his book, Help Your Toddler Meet Their Milestones, 101 Behaviour Hacks. During our discussion, you'll hear Chris talk about his book and how it helps parents learn how to help their child communicate, speak and much more. I'm sure you'll find Chrissy's insights as fascinating as I did. He has a very strong insight on what makes our children tick and how, as parents, you can make the most of your interactions and build an excellent bond. I'm Helen Thompson and welcome to First Time Mums Chat. I'm a childcare educator and baby massage instructor and no that being a parent for the first time is challenging and changes your life in every way imaginable. To help ease your transition into parenthood, I aim to offer supportive, holistic approaches and insights for mums of babies aged mainly from four weeks to 10 months old. My goal is to assist you to become the most confident parent you can and smooth out the bumps along the way. This podcast is brought to you by My Baby Massage. To find out how Baby Massage can help you to increase your confidence and feel more connected with your baby, check out My Baby Massage introduction video at mybabymassage.net forward slash intro. Let's do this together. This podcast is for informational purposes only and does not constitute medical advice. Please contact a medical practitioner if you are concerned or have any medical issues. Hi Chris and welcome to First Time Mums Chat. I'm delighted to have you here and I'm looking forward to hearing all about your book. Thank you so much, Helen. I'm very happy to be here with First Time Mums Chat. As you said, yes, I just released my book, Help Your Toddler and Meet the Milestones, 101 Behavior Hacks. I am a special educator and behavior therapist by trade, have been for the last 16 years. And two years ago, behind the pandemic, I had my first child. And this oh, changed right. my perspective so, so very much, as you can imagine. And watching her develop, my behavior therapist, special educator brain kept analyzing what I was seeing my child do in real time and what I do for my profession and living. And it made me realize how the ability to share information with a greater audience, specifically what things someone can say, specifically what things you can do, that will help your child develop a little faster. If they're neurotypical or typical, whatever language you prefer to use, this will help your child develop faster. If your child has any delays, this will help them catch up. Because it's evidence-based of applied behavior, and it's simple language that I use in my book to help any parent or new child learn how to help their kid communicate, speak, overcome eating, overcome tantrums, develop social skills, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm excited to share everything about it. I know some moms find the terrible twos really hard and the terrible Mm -hmm. twos can be quite a challenge. But to me, it's a positive approach. It's how you approach it. They aren't always that terrible. Mm -hmm. Would you agree with that? A hundred percent. A hundred percent. They're not that terrible. It's part of the persistence that we're not prepared for. And also children force our hand to develop our communication skills in ways that we thought we were done. You know, I think before you have a kid, you assume I'm done with how I need to communicate to people. You know how to make small talk if I'm at work or if I'm at a party and I don't know anyone. I know how to have a deep conversation with good friends and I know how to X, Y, and Z. But a child says, no, I need you to communicate with me when I'm being completely irrational. And you have no understanding of why I'm being completely irrational. Mm-hmm. And it makes us scratch our heads and say, well, this is just terrible. 
I shouldn't have to be working as hard. I shouldn't have to explain myself so many times. And it's a beautiful process when you get a chance to step back and really look at it from a bird's eye view. It is a beautiful process of development on our own person as well as a child. And I think sometimes parents lose the sense of what's happening to me as my child is developing. Because as your child is developing, you are developing as a parent. And, and I have stressed that point in my book. I call it the discipline of parenting because it is a practice. It is something that the more you see yourself a white belt, becoming a yellow belt, becoming a black belt as a parent, you start to realize, oh, there are certain skill sets that I possess. And the better and sharper I make these skill sets, the easier this whole process is. Not to say perfect, right? There is no perfect. I tell people, I need a perfect tree. But it can be less painful. <laughs> it can be easier to get through. And as I tell my staff, one day, sometimes I miss the forest for the trees. I say, pay attention to the trends. Don't just look for the final product. Don't just look for this student go from not sitting properly, or not talking to their perfect ideal student who's going to get a scholarship to Harvard. Pay attention to when they are making efforts. Pay attention when they're independently making efforts. Pay attention when each day that you have with them is a little bit easier. And give that child credit because they're aware of what they're trying to do. And they're also aware of whether or not they're getting any credit for it. And the more credit they get for making efforts, the faster they make progress. And I think it's accepting them for where they're at as well. As an adult, we always think we know how to disengage from somebody if we don't want to communicate with them. We understand that, but a child may not totally understand that. A child may be just saying, well, hang on a moment, just leave me be for a moment. I want some space. But they don't know how to communicate those skills. They don't know how to say that. And I think from your side, a child development person, that's probably common sense. But to a parent, that may not be common sense. 100%. 100%. And also to a parent, for the most part, we're tired. So (laughs) we don't always have the bandwidth to have the excessive empathy that's required to get a child from where they are to where they need. But as you said, Helen, perfectly stated, we need to meet them where they are. And literally, sometimes that means to get down at their eye level. Um, Mm -hmm. You can't stress how valuable this is to a child. Literally get yourself down on your knees, look them in the eyes so that they're the same level and communicate with them. If they're having a hard time when you do this, it's so much easier to bring them down than if you're cowling over them and saying, calm down, relax, and you're adding heat to this fire. They are developing. The brains are developing and they don't have a full prefrontal cortex until they're 25. So... You know, their ability to make executive functioning decisions and judgments about how my behavior right now will affect me next week, next month, next decade doesn't exist yet. Their ability to ask themselves how this affects other people doesn't exist. They're working very much in the moment. Is my need met? Yes or no. And if my need is not met, what has worked in the past to get my needs met? And I stress this with parents a lot when they think about the terrible twos because this is the transition period. And that transition from infancy to toddlerhood is not even it's transition huge. towards a child, right? Mm-hmm. Obviously, it's not difficult for parents, but when you think about it from the perspective of the child, for about the first 12 months of their life, they get a free ride, right? And they understand that if I want something, if I have a need that I register, what I need to do is cry. So if I have a need, I cry. Then I get X need met, and it makes perfect mm-hmm. sense. From the day they're born until they're about like 11 months, 12 months, until they start yeah, walking. Yeah. And then once they start walking, we're like, oh, that's great. You're walking. Let's do this. Let's do that. Okay, you can't walk here. So start running. Let them know they can't run. But between 15 months, 18 months, typically, they start getting a little bit of rules dished at them. And the situation starts to shift from I cry to get what I want to I must perform in order to get what I want. And they don't know all the regulations and performance that are required. They require us to explicitly explain this. Some parents don't realize that kids won't just have the common sense zapped into their brain one day and that they'll just figure out how it is to be Mm -hmm. human. You literally have to tell your child everything that is expected of them in every single circumstance or be sure that someone else is going to take that role. Otherwise, you can't be upset the child doesn't understand, right? You never told Mm -hmm. them that you can't shout at a funeral. You never told them that you shouldn't run at a pool. And obviously, life circumstances will be present in certain things. If they touch a hot plate, if they touch a hot stove, then you'll learn very quickly this is bad. 
but it's our job to give those goals. They are understanding. But wait, before I just had to cry and then I got whatever I want. I got milk. I got formula. You guys opened the window. It was cold. You guys put a blanket over me. That was how it was my entire life. That's a child's perspective. And now you're saying I need to perform. I don't like this. No, let's stick with how things were. And so the child is going to, from our vantage point, fight, right? Or manipulate, which they're not, disclaimer. They're just doing what had worked and what, for their point of view, was easier. And it's our job to help make that transition, that transformation rewarding by intentionally rewarding the behaviors we want to see, by intentionally making it fun to learn, by making it mm-hmm. fun to make progress, by making the energy we give the child bigger for the good things and very dull and plain and neutral for the bad things. It's not that you don't address the bad things, but if you, the only times that you raise your voice to your child are when you're displeased with them, that's very stimulating. And they're not calibrating that as this is bad, mom upset, mom is angry. They're calibrating, ooh, I heard my name and mom said it and I love hearing mom say my name. I need to do that again. That was stimulating. I like that. So and as I said before, it's tricky because we have to be really truly aware of how we are interacting. What am I doing as a parent? Because your child is yes. purely responsive, purely reactionary. And it's not intentional. It's not to cast blame on anyone. I don't want anyone to walk away from this podcast and feel guilty. I want people to walk away and feel aware. And say, huh, that's something for me to think about. Because once you have a broader sense of what accountability is available to you, then you literally have more power. You have more power in a situation. That's what I want people to walk away with. Knowing, oh, this is my power. If I respond to my kid with heat, I'm going to get heat. If I respond to my child with calm, I'm going to get calm. You have that power. You mentioned earlier about the stove and the swimming pool and things like that. I think a lot of the time it's trial and error. And Mm. obviously I'm not saying that you allow your child to jump in the pool and drown. Of course I'm not saying that. But (laughs) but allowing them the space to try. If you're there and you're saying, I'm here, jump in, see what happens. Giving them the opportunity to try things without the shoulds and oh, you can't do this, you can't do that. But obviously it's in reason. I'm not saying you tell a child to put their hand on a hot stove, but you give them the opportunity to try it. You give them the opportunity to experiment for themselves because that's what the Montessori approach is all about. And it's a beautiful approach. And as you said, if they touch a hot stove and they burn themselves, just like you said, and I think a lot of parents would almost feel guilty about it, but the extraordinary value in what you just said, it's actually so valuable in the moments that they hurt themselves to deliver the explanation. If a child is running around the pool and say, hey, sweetheart, we got to use our walking feet. It's not safe to run. Mm, mm, mm. And they look at you and register and they smile, that naughty smile, and they run and they slip. And nothing hospital worthy, but they fall and cry and say, sweetie, I wanted you to use your walking feet because it's safe. If you don't yes. need your walking through, this is what can happen. And that's how kids learn. When you explain yeah. in the moment, that's when oh, mom was trying to look out for me. I didn't understand. Okay, next time she gives me a warning, that has more weight. I'm going to do better at listening because she was trying to protect me. Obviously, mm. my rule of thumb is rule number one is be kind. So don't say it with nasty energy or snark. Yes. They don't need sarcasm. They don't get sarcasm it is valuable to explain kids need explanation and in those moments give the child the opportunity to understand this is why we have rules this is why we do good listening this is why mommy needs you this is why daddy needs you to do good listening Uh, how old is your daughter she's almost two and a half she turned 28 months last week and she is so much fun i have so much fun with her and my wife and i agreed that we would raise her screen free which makes it so much more time to connect it's funny, we agreed that we'd have a screen free up until she was two years old. And so for the last two and a half, three years, we haven't watched any TV. Now we'll say, okay, let's try to watch cartoons and sit down mm-hmm. with her. And within about a minute or two, she's like, mm, turn it off. I don't want to watch this. Like, That's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> if she watches anything, she'll just want to watch aquarium videos that play soothing music. Or she'll want to watch some sort of nature video on my phone. Like, oh, show me frogs, show me a hawk, show me mm. dolphins swimming. Something in nature, just being in nature. But she has zero interest in cartoons, movies, playing on her phone, anything. And she'll give our phones back to us if we put it down. But, you know, she's really good with rules. We started 
laying down rules with my daughter when she was only 10 months old because we live in a one bedroom apartment in Queens. So it, you open the front door and then there's a kitchen and then you have a little room and then uh, there's a hallway to the bathroom. And I'm very big on environmental toxins outside of this work. So I was always very particular about making sure she's nowhere near our shoes. I don't want her to be anywhere near our shoes in case we track in whatever yuck from outside. You can set boundaries with your kids as early as they're able to respond. Well, the parents that I work with and talk with, I always ask them, so at home, what are your rules? What rules do you have for your child? You know, they have this dumbfound expression on their face. Mm, yes, I can imagine. And it's not just that they never set any rules. It's the first time the thought has entered, I can set rules. Or I shouldn't be saying I don't believe in should, but you can set rules. And it's not to make your child some obedient slave, but it is to A, make your child accountable. It's to B, help them get a leg up on life because in life, there are rules. And it's not the wisest strategy to say, well, I want my child to have the freedom to do whatever they want in their home so that they have a happy childhood. While that may seem idyllic, it's going to create a very hard hit when the child leaves the household and is not well equipped for all the rules and consequences. And third, it also helps to establish a parent as an authority. It is your job as a parent to guide your kid out. It's your job as a parent to protect and provide and nurture your child. It's also your job to be the authority in the household. And like a lot of parents today I see they want to be friends with their kids. And it's good to be playful with your children and be able to play and have a beautiful relationship. But you are factually the authority. You're supposed to give your child's guidance. Like, this is what you can do and this is what you should not do. You know, this, this is something that's not wise to do. We have a number of different rules from cleaning up, things involving eating, like you can't remove anything from the plate. And it's all reasonable. And it's all things that you're able to do based on our ability to set these rules. But I think you can make rules, but make it playful. Because that's what I used to do in childcare. Play with your kids and let them have a good, lovely childhood. But do it in a playful way. And as you said, I don't like should and don't do this and don't do that. Because from my understanding, and please correct me if I'm wrong here, the kid will hear the last two words that you say. So if you say don't do that, they will hear do that. 100%. They won't hear the word don't. They'll hear do that. Mm -hmm. So it's a way of doing it in a, a positive way and saying, okay, well, let's do this together. Let's find out a way we can do this together. I think what you did is a great idea, but maybe let's try it this way. Don't say it might work better, but just shift the energy a little bit so that you're not using the word should and don't. And that's very hard. I acknowledge I do it occasionally. I'm not perfect. We all do it. And, you know, it comes down to practice, right? In my book, I offer parents affirmative alternatives to, mm-hmm, to don't mm-hmm. and stops and knows because it's natural for us to say, don't do this, don't eat things off the floor, don't run, don't bite, don't push, et cetera. Issue is when we do this, as you said, they're only hearing the last two words. Mm. For example, if I told them to not think of a green cat wearing a party hat riding a tricycle, you already have the image, despite the fact that the first word was don't. The same with children. And when you tell a child what not to do, you are not telling the child what to do. Yes. And, and, and that creates a vacuum and that creates some confusion. So let's say it comes down to practice. I had to practice it myself. My goal was to help other people have this information and share it with other people so that they can also share it with other people. But, you know, instead of telling the child, don't climb on the couch, you let them know we're at home. The place to climb is at the park. We're going to the park on Saturday. Yes. And be, oh, you don't like your food. You spit out your food. We don't spit. The only time you spit is when you brush your teeth. Tell a child where that behavior that they want to do is acceptable and let them know what is expected from this scenario. Let them know of the reason as well. Sometimes it's very valuable for children to understand why. Why do I have to go to bed at 8 p.m.? Why, why can't I eat food off the floor? It still tastes good. That cookie tastes just as good on the floor as it did in my plate. Mm-hmm. What's the problem? They don't understand, right? But if you can, in simple language, say if you eat things off the floor, Something that's dirty, it can make you sick. Remember when you were sick, you didn't feel very good, right? Mommy doesn't want you to be sick. And that's going to register better than don't do that. Stop that. Give me that. Yeah, definitely. I think it all boils down to communication and Mm. being considerate and being caring and kind, as you mentioned before. And communicating in a simple way as well. But it's not always easy. We all make mistakes. It's not easy and it's not a one-off. 
that's the other thing. I think some people want, they want the fat burner pill when it comes to working with kids. Just take this after holiday and I'll lose 15 pounds. You have to keep at it. Consistency. You're going to tell a child to rule. You're going to tell a child to rule again. And what will happen is you recognize that I have to continue to lay down this rule is that you'll start to be able to anticipate preemptively. So if you notice your kid really likes to, to run around after you come back from the park, when you come home, you say, remember, sweetie, now that we're back in the park, running time is over. We're using our walking feet in the house. We're going to yes. take off our shoes. We're going to do this. We're going to have snack, And then we're going to do this. And that's going to be very helpful for the child. Kids love getting a layout of their schedule because they don't have much agency. And we don't really appreciate that for kids. I can't tell you how often I hear the staff say, oh, why are you so sad? What do you have to cry about? And first, I remind them, well, understand they have autism. That's part of why they're not very happy in this moment. Two, having bills is not the end-all, be-all for happiness or not being happy. These kids can't leave the room if they want to. They can't go outside for a breath of fresh air. They can't pick what food they're going to eat. They can't pick what clothes they're going to wear. That's insane. If that was us, we'd be in prison. And we look at them like, why are you stressed out? They're stressed out because they have no power over them. And they know it. Mm. And so sometimes the only power they have is what we look at as driving us crazy. No, they're just being free in the moment by running around and climbing or doing something. But again, they're not manipulated. They're surely doing what has given them some feedback that they like or some response that they like. And it's simply based on what has been rewarding and reinforced. In the past, well, we need to be consistent is really the key. And reward when we see them doing the behaviors we want. We want to create the trend. Because we are going to have to repeat ourselves. And then when you see them almost engage in a behavior, but catch themselves, that's so valuable that, hey, I saw that. Thank you for controlling yourself. Thank you for being a good listener. You want to tell your child every single day, you want to find an excuse every single day to tell your child, thank you for being a good listener. Thank you for doing good listening. Make that part of your regular vocabulary you're saying to your kid, because what you praise your child for, they want to do more of. And you just need to praise good behavior. And that's what's really going to grow. If we're not praising good behavior and we're only getting loud or demonstrative or saying their name over and over and over again when they're doing behavior we don't like, that's what's going to grow. Yeah. But focus wherever the attention goes, that's going to grow. So be mindful. And thanking them. I'm mentioning this for a reason because I've worked with autistic kids before. And I remember an incident where this child was playing up and I was picking them up for school and they were playing up and the teachers supported me but we had to walk home and he was doing his thing and I just let him do his thing and after about 15-20 minutes of him being at home he'd sort of calmed down I just let him do what he needed to do to calm down and he actually said to me Helen I'm really sorry for my bad behavior Mm -hmm. and I looked Mm -hmm. at him and I said to him you don't have to apologize to me for your bad behavior but I really appreciate the fact that you are apologizing because it wasn't your behavior that was a problem. He was apologizing to me, but I also realized that he didn't need to apologize because it was just the way he was. And that's the point I wanted to say is that it's respecting the child too, respecting your child for where they're at. Right. I just knew the space that he was in at a particular time. And yes, it was a bit of a pain because it took 20 minutes more to get home than it normally would have done. (laughs) But that wasn't the point. The point was that we did get home and he did defuse. He did work it out. He worked it out by himself because I let him do it. I knew what he was going through. He'd had a rough day at school. He just needed to calm down. And I just let him do that. And we just had a hug and we had some afternoon tea and we enjoyed the rest of the afternoon. It made me think about what we've just been saying. Empathy and respect from the child where they are. Remember that they're a person. Ultimately, they're a person. Although they're young and they're learning and they don't have the language skills, they feel and they respond and they're aware of what's happening. And they pick up on tone. They pick up on body language. And, you know, it, it's worth us remembering that we are to be kind. And all things that you do, kids, just remember that I'm frustrated about it. And you're teaching them that kindness as well. If you're gentle, and as I said, it's not easy to, at times, You've just got to take a big, deep breath and just go, okay, I know this is where you're at right now, but let's just keep going and we'll work it out. So, but if anybody wants to get in touch with you and to find out more about your book, how can they go about doing that? Available on Amazon. You can go to 
behaviorhacks.com. One, and you'll see links to my paperback as well as ebook. Uh, there's contact form, reach out there if you have questions, if you're struggling, if you're curious about red flags, about delays, if you want a little bit of advice, I have consultations as well, 15 minute consultations that are available right now. I want people to have the confidence to know that you can use these phrases, physical intervention, physical ways to interact with your kid. They'll make a big difference as long as you're consistent. And obviously do it with kindness, but the consistency is key. You don't have to mm. suffer through it. The terrible twos. I'd rather that be the transformational twos. I like that. <laughs> I'm not going to say the terrible twos don't exist because I think I'm going into danger there. But I do believe from what we said <laughs> that there are ways, as you say, thinking of it as a transformational twos. Well, thank you, Chris. I do hope that you've got some good takeaways from my discussion with Chris. I highly recommend checking his Help Your Toddler Meet Their Milestones 101 Behaviour Hacks book. And I've included links in the show notes, which can be accessed at mybabymassage.net forward slash podcast forward slash 103. Next week, I'm chatting with April Duffy, who runs a very busy Facebook group totally dedicated to the topic of cloth diapers or nappies for those of you located outside of North America. You'll hear April and I discuss some questions when it comes to this topic. Our featured review is from a fan, Daffodil, who gave us this great review on Apple Podcasts. No one really teaches us how to parent. This is a great podcast. Thanks for the Uplist Gym review. If you enjoy the show, please rate and review this podcast on Apple Podcasts and I'll feature my favourite review on the next episode.